Good morning, Kamiki Christian Church. That's all right. It's always great to get started in praise and worship. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we were 
everyone. My name is Danny. It's really good to have you here. I'm one of the pastors, and uh, really, it's awesome that you're here with us. If you're online, we're really glad you're joining us online as well. We've got a lot in store for our service today. Pastor JR is going to be preaching the word. He's going to be preaching out of Matthew 16. Now, for those of you who don't know, Pastor JR is our leading candidate for the position of lead pastor of Kaimiki Christian Church. This will be his second message for us. He preached last week. He's preaching this weekend, and he's going to be preaching about the church and its unique identity and its impact and its invincibility, and he's going to talk about that. He's going to open the word, and we're going to see what Jesus had to say about the church. I'm going to ask you to continue standing because we're not done worshiping. We're not done lifting our hands and our hearts in praise and prayer. We have the message coming up. We have more worship. We also have a time of communion, and we also have a time of offering, and we're going to do this all together as a church family. And I know that our hearts are heavy. We're seeing what's happening in the world and in the news. And uh, today's message, I would hope you would encourage us as the church to strengthen our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus in terms of turmoil and politics and all that, that Christ be lifted up. That is the most important thing. And uh, we know that there's a lot happening. Uh, so as you think about those things, let's focus our eyes and our hearts on him but before we do that though and continuing in worship i'm gonna do one thing turn around if there's someone you don't know greet them with the love of christ and just say hey thank you for being here this morning let's do that right now
You have a seat at this time. Uh, before I ask JR to come up to the stage, though, um, just, uh, just something that uh, is a little bit different for today's service. Uh, he's going to preach the word. Don't worry about that. And uh, we're going to have a response song in worship. Um, but right after the service today, uh, right after the benediction, we're going to have a Q&A time. And what happened uh, is that throughout the week, and even including last weekend, uh, many of you submitted questions uh, for Pastor JR. And so right after our benediction, he and I are going to come to the stage, and we're going to go through that. We're going to have a Q&A time, and you are welcome to stay for that. In fact, we want you to do that. But if you need to go, you need to pick up your cakey or whatever it might be, feel free to do that, all right? So once the benediction is given, you can go ahead and, and uh, do that. But if you can stay, we'd love to have you here because uh, JR and I will be here on the stage to go through that Q&A. Pastor JR is going to give the message today. And so would you give him a warm Kaimiki Christian Church welcome as he comes to the stage? Good morning, everyone. Um, it, it's, uh, I think my affection for uh, the church family is growing more and more just as, as the weeks go by, uh, if it hasn't already been there already. So uh, it, it's such an honor to be here. It's a privilege to be uh, in front of, of this body uh, for so many different reasons. And it, it does remind me, and I think this is an important thing uh, to share, it does remind me of when I first uh, decided that I was going to uh, reroute from uh, the original career path that I had designed, or that I had desired to go down, which was a, a career in research biology, right? So I had always wanted to move back to Hawaii, but originally it wasn't to work at a church, it was to work at Sea Life Park. Um, uh, and you'll hear about that story later. And God uh, rerouted my desires, and so I remember thinking, okay, uh, I've now made the decision to pursue a career in vocational ministry, and that was a question that was posed um, online that I'm, I'm going to answer later during the Q&A, uh, is how did, I, how did I end up deciding I wanted to become a pastor? And so, but there was actually something that happened when I did decide I wanted to become a pastor. So I visited the seminary that uh, I was intending to pursue my education in, and I was there in the office of uh, the Director of Admissions and Placement, and he asked me, so why do you want to become a pastor? What are your desires? I explained everything that I've shared with many of you about my desire to come back to Hawaii and bring the gospel ministry here. And he said, <clears throat> he said, those are all the right answers. And he said, I just want you to know, though, that from a pragmatic and worldly perspective, it makes absolutely no sense for you to want to be a pastor. I thought, great, that's really encouraging. <laughs> Uh, and then I went home uh, with uh, one of the family members in our extended family who I was staying with. And for the next day, she tried to convince me to not pursue that career. I guess it really didn't make sense from a worldly perspective. As soon as she found out that I visited a seminary, she said, for the sake of you and for the sake of your future family, do not go down that route. So why am I here right now? That's a great question because that was uh, 18 years ago, I believe. Uh, something like that. Yeah, 18 years ago, almost 20 years ago. And I obviously have a desire to pastor, a desire to do ministry, but it's been more than just about desire. Because if it was only about desire, I may have been out of the ministry a long time ago. In fact, the first time I had thoughts of quitting was in my second semester of seminary was when I thought, I don't think this is for me. Uh, but beyond desire, there's been a conviction that I've had, namely about the church that I pray through every Sunday morning before I step into any pulpit, before I walk into any church building. Uh, I've thought through and prayed through the words that Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. And that's the text I want to focus on today, which answers the question, why the church? What is it about the church that has kept me in the church and has, has continued to burn that desire to stay in vocational ministry for the sake of the church. And it's not anything that anybody else said to me about the church or against the church. It's just something that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke over 2,000 years ago that still rings true today. And that's from Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. And 
that's going to be up on the screen on the PowerPoint here. But for the sake of context, I'm actually going to start in verse 13 so we can see what's happening here. <clears throat> so this is Matthew chapter 16. But starting in verse 13, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, and by the way, this is the most important question that anyone can answer. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. If you can join me in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you as we come before you for the opportunity and the privilege to be the gathered church here, and I pray that the words of Christ here would speak powerfully to our hearts, would be embedded and hidden at the depth of our hearts, uh, and would encourage us to continue to live out uh, our lives and our ministry as a local church, and it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. As Christians, it used to be this way, right, where um, being a part of the church wasn't a novel thing, wasn't an unexpected thing. If you called yourself a Christian, chances are even till this day, if you tell a non-Christian that you're a Christian, they'll ask, so where do you or do you go to church, right? And if you tell another Christian that you're a Christian, they'll ask you, so which church do you go to? And then you'll ask them, oh, you're a Christian too. Well, which church do you go to, right? So it has been understood in society and in the context of the Christian community that being a Christian and being a part of, right, or going to church are, are supposed to be inextricable. We understand that. And that's why many of you are here today. Uh, whether it's by habit or by conviction, you are here because you see the connection between being a part of the church and the faith that you profess in Jesus Christ. But I say that because more and more, uh, there is a brand of professing Christianity that's developing uh, especially amongst the younger generation, especially amongst my generation, and I hate to say that we started it, perhaps, right? And it's a brand of professed Christianity that says that we can be Christians without having to be a part of the church, right? And I remember that developing and hearing that even when I was in college where people were starting to lose trust in the church because of previous experiences, things that they had heard. And that's why, by the way, there are so many books out there on church growth because the church, it looks like, in different parts of the world, isn't growing, right? If the church was growing and the church was proliferating before our eyes, we wouldn't be writing books and literature on how to grow a church. But the reason why we do is because we look and we're seeing Christians who are true Christians who don't want to be a part of of the church anymore. Before I came to Hawaii, one of the directors of one of the largest denominational conventions here told me, just to warn you, you are going to see a lot of beautiful church buildings that have no people in it and that have no pastor in it. That's just where we're at today. And for various reasons, you know, for, for some people, going to church is precious, right? For many of you here, this is a precious part of your life and that's why you're here uh, listening to me, and I hope I'm, I'm going to deliver God's word to you, right? But for other people, for one, going to church just is pointless. Why would I go to church when there are so many other things I could be doing on a Sunday morning? Why be a part of the church when I already have my friends, I already have my family? And for other people, going to church just isn't pragmatic. It's too difficult to get to church on Sunday, to go to Bible studies on Wednesday, to be involved in the life of this church. It's not that they hate the church. They just, how, how, how do you even be involved in the church with the kind of schedules and logistics that we have today? And then for some people, and this is the truth, and I've learned this the more and more I've been 
and pastoral ministry that going to church is painful. There are things that have happened in your life and the lives of others close to you that make walking into the church difficult. And I've met Christians, genuine Christians, who have said, I will never step foot in the church again. And thankfully, after 30-something years, they have. But you realize that the experience of everybody else is different. Even though we all understand to some level that we should be a part of the church, the question I want to answer that this text answers today is why. Why should we be involved and be a part of the church? And so we have to understand the uniqueness of the church, not from anybody else's eyes, because there are a lot of people who can convince you to both stay in the church or leave the church, depending on who you're talking to. But we need to hear from God himself and from God's eyes and from the words of Jesus Christ himself, who is the Lord of our lives, why the church is unique. And that's the same reason why I continue to stand here today and preach primarily from a pulpit in the church. And the church is unique for three reasons, according to Christ. The first one is this, is that the church is unique in its identity. The church is unique in its identity Jesus says, I mean, there was so much confusion as to who Jesus was. People said, you're Elijah. People said, you're one of the prophets. There were a lot of people who loved Jesus. There were a lot of people who were indifferent to Jesus. There were a lot of people who were interested in Jesus. And there was a growing community of people that wanted to kill Jesus. Because you had this carpenter from Nazareth who was teaching with authority, who was going against the religious establishment, who was performing miracles, and those things could not be doubted. And when you, whenever you have the revelation of Christ to the world, there's controversy. And so you had people debating as to who Jesus was. And then Jesus asks, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you, with all clarity, no second guessing, Peter said, revelation from God to him that you are the Christ. In other words, you are the one that the entire Old Testament points to as the one who will come to save people from their sins. You are the one. You're the Christ. And not just that, you're not just any man. You're not just a good teacher. You are the son of the living God. You are God himself. That was a massive, massive confession. And Jesus says, Upon this rock, upon that confession, not upon you, Peter, you were not the Pope, right? But upon that confession you made that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God, Jesus gives this revelation and he says, I, not an angel, not a servant, but he says, I him, Jesus himself, I will build. He is going to die. He is going to rise. But after that, Jesus said, I am not going to stop working. I am going to be in the business of building. But building what? Because remember, God in the Old Testament had told Israel, I'm going to build it. I want you to build a tabernacle for me. That's where my glory is going to dwell. And then after that, right, it's build a temple. Tabernacle is no longer there. The temple was destroyed. And now Jesus says again, upon this confession... And upon and on everybody who professes the same thing, he says, I will build, not I might build, not I want to build, but I will build my church. Right? And the church in the New Testament has never referred to a building or a structure or a facility. It's always referred to a community of people, an assembly. Literally, ecclesia, right? The called out ones, right? So Jesus says. I am going to build something that belongs to me, and it's no longer a physical structure. It's going to be a people, a people who are called out of the world, holy and set apart for God, for his work, for his purposes, and and they are not going to be based upon any law, but upon a confession of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and God himself. And this assembly of people... This community of people is going to have no bounds ethnically because the disciples who are in that community are going to be from every tribe and tongue and nation and people. And there are going to be no bounds geographically 
because it's going to start in, Ju- in Jerusalem. It's going to extend to all of Judea. It's going to extend to all of Samaria. Remember, Peter, the place that you guys don't like. And it's like going to go through the Roman Empire and beyond that, and even to the ends of the earth. And that is the church. And that church is going to be manifested in local assemblies like the one we're a part of today. That is the church. It is the most glorious institution in which the glory of God would be particularly seen. The church is the body of Christ, the household of God, the people of God, called out to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, just as we are called out by God. So now we call out to the world and proclaim to the world that Jesus is the Christ and the son of the living God. There is only one body of Christ, and that is the church. You know, in one sense, and in a full sense, everything does belong to the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, right? I remember back when we were living in San Jose, we're in the sprawling apartment complex, and all the little boys, right, and my son somehow got grafted into that group. And you can think, when little boys get together, they don't do good things. And so (laughs) they would line up snails in a line, and one of the boys would take a bike Yes, and run over the whole line. And finally, for one, it's disgusting. But finally, I went down and said, you can't do that anymore. And they said, but why not? And I said, because they're not your snails. They belong to the Lord. And so does the ocean. And so does Diamond Head. And so does every person on this planet. The earth is the Lord's and everything. And God owns everything. There isn't an inch on this universe, visible and invisible, that Jesus Christ does not say is his. But yet the church is the one institution that God has never allowed or permitted Satan to have dominion over. The church is the body of Christ. And that's why, by the way, it has been such a sobering experience to even apply for this position. Because I know that I have been applying for a pastoral position at a church that for the last hundred years has never lost its pastor. Jesus is the Lord of the church. Jesus is the pastor of this church, and he has never relinquished that to anybody else, and that's why the gospel continues to go out from this community to the world. To be a man or a woman or a boy or a girl after God's heart means realizing that the church has a special place in the heart of God. And that's why Jesus says, I will build my church. It's his church. The church is unique in its identity. And we are called to engage in the life of the church because we are the church. The church is unique in its identity. But number two, the church is unique in its indestructibility. In its invincibility, Jesus says, I will build my church. But what about the church? He says, the gates of Hades, right? And so back then, right, whenever a nation invaded another nation, what did they do? They besieged it, put walls around it. They would put gates around it to prevent the people from trying to escape and multiply and grow in power. And so for 2,000 years, Satan has tried to put gates around the church and keep the church from growing, using various different strategies to try to squelch the growth of the church. But the reason why it has not happened is because Jesus said and promised that the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Jesus didn't say that the gates of Hades won't attack the church. He doesn't say the gates of Hades won't persecute the church, but it will never overpower the church. In other words, the church will be invincible and indestructible both in its existence and in its ministry. You know, as, which means as a pastor, as long as I don't disqualify myself personally, I have job security because there will always be a need for a pastor because the church will never die. Now, Toys R Us, that one died right? I remember that. I thought that's never going to go away. And all of a sudden, Amazon came and no more Toys R Us, right? 
Borders Bookstore, right? Barnes & Noble, where I used to go every day, or almost every day as a kid, right? To buy book after book after book. I thought that would be there forever. That's no longer there, right? Coco Marina Theaters, right? Where I first saw Free Willy, I remember. That was the theater I saw it in. That's no longer there either. And then Blockbuster right next door, which was, I mean, I lived in that place. That's no longer there either. My own family, right, that I grew up in, mom and dad after they divorced, we no longer were a family like we used to. The Persian Empire is no longer there either, right? Neither is the Babylonian Empire. Neither is the Roman Empire. Neither is the Spanish Empire. Neither is the Mongol Empire. But all throughout the rising and the falling of every institution, the church has remained. And the church has not been without its problems. In all my years of ministry, and I believe it's the same for you, I've never been a part of a church that was problem-free, uh, both from the outside and the inside. A good friend of mine who was my classmate in seminary told me about how he, well, he didn't tell me. We saw it in the news. He was arrested for having a church service in Alberta, Canada. You're thinking, what could go wrong over there? But he did. And I remember talking with another fellow, long-standing pastor who used to be in the military, uh, was in active duty, whose wife said that after a while she realized he had PTSD symptoms, but she realized it wasn't from his time in the military or at war. It was because of his experience as a pastor in the church. Satan has always tried to attack the church from the outside through persecution, and he's always tried to attack the church from the inside through false teaching, through factions, through conflict, through politics. But the church has continued to grow because truthfully, there is no game plan against the church because there is no strategy against the Holy Spirit who is growing the church. The church will win because Jesus will win. And Jesus will never allow his body to die. That's why the church is indestructible. It's unique in its identity. It's unique in its indestructibility. And finally, the church is unique in its impact. Jesus said, and this was a promise, I will give you, the church, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, you remember what Jesus told the Pharisees, why he indicted them. He said, you shut out people from going into the kingdom of heaven, not because they had the authority to do so, but because they tried to kill off all the people who could have influenced the people to go into the kingdom of heaven. And in Luke eleven fifty two, 52, he says that you have taken away from the people the keys of knowledge, right? You've taken away from people. You've, you've kept them from hearing the truth that can get them into the kingdom of God. But Jesus says to Peter, to the church, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, I will entrust to you and to everybody who is a part of this institution the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that when heard and believed in can usher people into the kingdom of heaven. That's what it means when Jesus says, to you, the church has been given the keys. We live in a dying world. All you have to do is watch the news or look around. We live in a dying world, but the hope for a dying world is not a new president. The hope for a dying world is a coming kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And who has the keys to usher people into the coming kingdom? None other than the church through its evangelistic ministry, through its discipleship ministry, the ministry of outreach that brings the gospel to the lost people so they hear and are ushered into the kingdom and the ministry of discipleship in the church that mentors and equips people to stay on path to the kingdom. I mean, think about this church's ministry for the past 100 years. And I know it's not been free of problems, but think about the number of people on this island who are no longer hellbound, but are now on their way to heaven because of the faithful ministry of this body of people for the last 100 years. And many of you are here today. Many of you I know personally, God has continued to save people in this island through the ministry of this church. And what other institution has ever been given the same kind of influence and impact in the world as the church. The church is unique in its identity. The church is unique 
in its indestructibility, and the church is unique in its impact. That's why we persevere. And I'll end with this. When we went through a really difficult church experience in the early part of our ministry, um, that was the first thought of, why did I even do this? Because the pain was unbelievably painful. As, and as a non-Christian, I had never experienced anything like that. Later on, someone asked me, uh, namely in my, in my ordination, my second ordination, so now that years have passed, what did you learn from that experience in your first ministry? And I said, it was this, that at the end of the day, through the ministry of that church that I was a part of, there were people who heard the gospel and were saved. And there is going to be a day where when Jesus comes to judge the earth, there are certain people who will not be thrown in the lake of fire, but will be ushered into Christ's eternal kingdom because the gospel came out through the church that I was pastoring in. And if the pain and the heartache and the betrayal was the price that we had to pay to see people saved, then that was a price worth paying. The church is not without its problems, but it is unique in its identity. As the body of Christ, it is unique in the sense that it will never be destroyed, and it is unique in that it has been given the keys. You have been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and that's why we are a part of the church. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, for Jesus Christ who has saved us, for Jesus Christ who gives us hope for a coming kingdom, and we look forward to his return, and we pray that as a church we would continue to live out our ministry as you have called us to, as we've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And I pray that we would be faithful in all that we do before you and that we would see the fruit of that in our lives and in the lives and in the age after. And it's in the name of your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Please stand in your seats.
the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the have a seat at this time. We're going to continue in our worship together as a church family. We're going to come around the table of communion. And Pastor JR shared uh, this morning the church. It's unique. It's identity. It's unique in its indestructibility. It's unique in its impact. In that passage, Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And he said, and I will give you the keys, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. As we hold on to these elements, it's a reminder that it's through Jesus Christ that we have access to the Father. He is the key in that sense. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the door. And he's given you that key. When you've placed your faith and your hope in him, you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so as you hold these elements, thank him. Thank him for the keys that he has given to you. And use this time to recommit yourself to him. Maybe some of us have lost those keys in a sense. We kind of placed it down. And we forgot we've been given those keys. Use this time this morning to reconnect and to say, Lord, I need you. Thank you for giving me these keys. I'm going to pick it back up. And I'm going to share your love with others. And so it's our custom to hold the bread and the cup, these elements of communion, until we've all been served. And then once we have all been served, I'll come up and I'll pray. And we'll eat and we'll drink together. So ushers, will you please come forward at this time?
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Christ Jesus, and it's in him that we place our faith and our trust, and he is the cornerstone. And as it says in your word, God, that we are being built into your Son, Christ Jesus, a dwelling place for your Holy Spirit, uh, the church. And so we thank you that we get to um, come around the table of communion together to remember your son's past sacrifice, and his future return. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's eat and drink together. I want to ask our ushers to come forward at this time to receive our tithes and our offerings. And as a reminder, it all belongs to the Lord and Pastor J.R. quoted from Psalm, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And um, it's a reminder that we are not giving back anything. We're returning back to him what's already his. And uh, we thank the Lord for your faithfulness. And I thank the Lord for your faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ and that you have a love for one another. And it, ex it is expressed so wonderfully in so many ways in your time, and your talent, and your treasure. So thank you, church family. Um, and if you're a guest here, uh, we just want to say thank you for joining us. Uh, there is no obligation at all on this uh, during this time. We just want you to be blessed. And thank you for joining us here this morning. Also, our Easter offering is still available. If you'd like to participate in that, uh, just write Easter on uh, your envelope if you're dropping that off in the, uh, as the bowls go by. Um, and that still remains available for anyone to participate in until the end of this month. All right, well, I got a few announcements, and then we will uh, close our service and then go into our Q&A session. VBS is coming up, Vacation Bible School, VBS, June 3 through 7, so it's a little earlier in the summer for us. If you would like to sign up and bring your kids to that, we still got spots, but here's the thing. We also need people to serve. Think about a way that you can help kids come to know who Jesus is and, and, and meet him. The keys to the kingdom <laughs> belongs to the, such as these, these little ones. You can be a part of that, and we'd ask that you'd help us. Come and serve. Serve the kids. Serve the Lord as you do so. And so you can sign up by going to kaimakeechristian.org slash VBS. We'd love to have you here. Also, we've got a prayer and worship night coming up on April 21st. That's Sunday from 5 o'clock to 6.30 right here in our worship center as we come before the Lord just seeking his direction as we continue in this path of the lead pastor. And um, we would just invite you to come. Uh, we just want to use that time to pray and to worship and to seek the Lord together as a, as a family. Uh, so you're invited to come to that. Again, that's Sunday, April 21st from 5 to 6.30 right here in our worship center. If you're a member of our church, you would have received a letter in the mail uh, by now, and it has a voting ballot. We're going to receive those ballots on April 26th and 28th. So you want to bring that ballot uh, with your vote if you're a member of this church uh, on that weekend. We're not going to give the ballots out that weekend, okay? So you should have received it in the mail, but uh, that is the weekend uh, where we'll take the vote on our next lead pastor. Again, that's April 26th and 28th. You should have received in the mail your ballot if you're a member of Kaimiki Christian Church. Okay? All right. Well, I'm going to give the benediction, and as soon as I do that, you can be excused if you want to get your kids, but please stay for our Q&A because JR is going to come up and we're going to have a little bit of a discussion time. All right? Let's stand for the benediction. Church, you are the dwelling place of God's Holy Spirit. And so, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you all, and have a great week in the Lord. If you need to go, please do so. But otherwise, stick around. We're going to do Q&A right now, all right?
All right, everyone, thank you for uh, staying with us. And uh, we are going to move into our Q&A session. And just a little bit of a, an FYI on how we got to the questions here. Uh, this is, we're not doing an open mic. If we did that, we'd probably be here quite a while. So what we asked you to do, though, was starting last week and all throughout the week, uh, we, had, uh, we had opportunities for you to submit some questions for JR. And uh, we received a number, and we tried to collate and compile those. We didn't want to. We wanted to give you time to think about what you wanted to ask, but also give us time to put it together. And so um, that's that's how this all got, you know, came to this point. And um, I'm going to just ask you the questions, Jr. These are the questions that came in, and uh, we'll just hear from Jr. And if you're here from his heart, that's what we're here for this morning. So, uh, Jr., let me ask you this. You alluded a little bit to this already in your message, but, you know, your decision to become a pastor, um, you, you spelled that out. But tell us a little bit about your school and how, where you grew up, uh, what school you went to. Yes, yeah, super important here in Hawaii. It's like, hey, what school did you go to? Uh, but tell us a little bit about that, that journey uh, until you got to becoming a pastor. Yeah, so in terms of schooling, so I was born in the Philippines, but then we moved here when I was two. And uh, so I went to start the C school for preschool. And so I was there. I remember my first grade teacher, or my preschool teacher's name. It was Mrs. Gomes. Uh, she's probably still there. And, um, and then at four years old, though, so I was there for two years. I uh, had a great time. Uh, so I actually started my education here in the U.S. And then we moved back to the Philippines when I was four. And then we would go back and forth, at least spend our summers and winters here. Um, but from kindergarten all the way through second grade. I was actually held back in kindergarten. Um, I didn't realize why until I think six years ago. I was already a father with two, and apparently I was held back because I wasn't emotionally mature enough to go uh, into first grade. So um, I found that out recently. I'm like, that's why I have to see that, that teacher every morning for some behavioral specialist or something. <laughs> so, uh, but then we came back here when I was in third grade, uh, and I went to Marion All School for two years from third through fourth grade, and then went to Punahou for fifth and sixth grade. And that's when, after that was when my parents divorced and we moved to the mainland. And then um, went to middle school in Los Angeles, went to high school in Las Vegas, and then went to college in UC San Diego, where I, I got my degree in biology. And then it was in my third year that God rerouted me. And then so uh, pursued pastoral ministry in 2006, starting with uh, I'm in education in, or I got my MDiv at the Master's Seminary in Sun Valley, California, which is, I guess, now just part of Los Angeles County. And then uh, graduated with my MDiv there from in 2011, and then uh, went back to school uh, in 2016 to get my doctorate uh, from the same seminary and graduated in 2019. So, so um, you know, kind of tracking with your message today, you talked about keys. And um, tell us a little bit about the keys that you were given in your pastoral ministry. Uh, give us a little bit of a rundown on that. The keys that you were given and um, your style in leading as you were handed those keys. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember the first time I, I was encouraged to share the gospel as a believer. Um, and that was with my freshman year roommate. And I was so just daunted by the prospect because I was thinking, if he says no, I have to live with this every day. Um, and so finally, uh, one, it was a, I think it was a Thursday evening uh, sometime in our, in the third quarter at UCSD. Um, he agreed to meet um, and, and have a Bible study with me, uh, you know, in our dorm room. And so we did. And then he said, you know, I've been waiting for you to talk to me about this this whole year because I see you going off to some group event every night and I've been wondering about these things but I've just been waiting for you to talk to me but you never have and I said oh um, well and I just said would you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and he said yes and I said oh you do <laughs> um, and uh, and then I remember praying and not knowing what to do so I left the room uh, right after that and uh, I just saw him on Thursday he was here visiting Hawaii with his wife and his kids and he's still a believer till this day and I think that, for me, set the, the tone of, of relational evangelism. Um, uh, and so that had always been my style in terms of evangelizing. That said, uh, God's put me in different platforms, uh, like 
preaching at a church or, or being a college pastor where you meet a lot of non-believers and, and them hearing the gospel from the pulpit, teaching at a Christian school where kids who have no church background hear the gospel for the first time. And then my wife and I met at a homeless ministry um, uh, in San Diego. Um, we were both a part of that ministry. That's how we met, where we would go out and share the gospel with um, with homeless folks in Hillcrest, if you've ever been there in San Diego. And then we got engaged on an evangelistic uh, campaign in Argentina. So that's where we did the door-to-door -door thing there. So um, God has made me use every platform. Uh, I am a more relational person. Uh, that's also that's how I heard the gospel as well, was through um, key relationships in my life. But, yeah. So... Uh Part of your leadership style is relational, and, um, and I, I've seen that too. And uh, you know, I have a similar story sharing the gospel message with my roommate. He wasn't my roommate, but my best friend. Um, that he said no. Yeah, I still pray for him though. <laughs> um, Jr., let me ask you this: in regards to um, Kaimiki Christian Church, what do you like most about KCC? Uh, what are some big challenges that you see in uh, this role, and um, how would you address those challenges? You know, this this is just a beautiful church. I mean, from my first day stepping foot here, you you, you feel the the love permeating from the people, right? Both on the school end as well as on the church end. And uh, I remember when I first preached here, thinking, I don't know why, but this is my favorite place to preach at here in Hawaii. It's just it's different. And but for me, what has really stood out is the church is 100 years old. And after 100 years, uh, the truth of the gospel and the truth of the word continues to go out from the church. And, and it's maintained its integrity like that. And that is unique, by the way. When I tell people that I'm, I'm here at a church now, it's 100 years old and the gospel still continues to be preached in its truthfulness um, from people who have this just incredible loving spirit you don't find that in many places in the world or even in hawaii for that matter this is a unique place um and the challenge is that it's a big church you know it's and whenever the organization gets bigger the institution gets bigger you just have a lot more moving parts and, and to keep all those moving parts unified without being a micromanager is it's it's a tightrope right and so how do you address that? It's, it's through all of you. You know, in Ephesians 4, uh, it says that pastors are here not to do all the work, but to equip the saints who God has called out, right, through the gifting that the Holy Spirit's placed in each person for the work of ministry, and that's how the church continues to be built. And so the challenge is also what makes me excited, because uh, one thing I just love to see is, is members come who have a passion and a heart because of what God has placed in them, for a particular ministry and seeing that just develop into and into what it eventually will become um, is is a privilege that we all as pastors want to be a part of and so and then to continue to invest in uh, the key leaders of of the church who will carry out uh, the work of ministry as well so yeah and I'm, i want to come back to that uh as we get closer to the end of our q a time about that what you just said about equipping the saints um, because I think there's something really important to say about that. And, uh, but ho let's hold that thought. I wanted to ask you this. You know, some Christians believe that we're living in the end times. Obviously, the news, uh, very salient point on that. Um, we're just seeing lots of things happening. Uh, will you be preaching and te or teaching and or teaching on that issue? Can't escape it because it's in the Bible, and in every book in the Bible, you run into it, you know. And so... The answer is yes. Am I am I going to make that a, a you know a hobby horse? No. Uh, you know I have preached on it, um, in, uh, in in Bible class here. You know the students have said we've been waiting for for this lesson for a long time. I've preached on it or I've taught on it at the BIH class, and, and I will. And the one thing that the church has to know is that you know with regards to the end times, um, there are a lot of different views uh, on how to interpret the Book of Revelation, how to interpret different passages of the Bible and the prophetic books. And to know that, this is just to remind everybody that whichever view you believe in, um, you have a good camp of godly scholars who are behind you. So you don't have to feel threatened that whatever view I have is the one that you need to have or ought to have because there's, you know, um, there are different views out there from godly people. Um, and so obviously the pastor has to preach 
um, what he is convicted is true, but uh, it's not a make or break issue. So, um, so hopefully when I do get to that part of, you know, you have to preach the whole counsel of God, but hopefully when I do get to that part, no one will feel like, oh, because I, I disagree on the timing of this and I disagree with when you, what you believe is going to happen with here and here, that that means that you can't be a part of the church, right? Obviously you can. Um, and so, and uh, as pastors, we all, we all believe this. Our views are, are still continuing to develop. But yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, in regards to viewpoints and uh, opinions and certainly what shapes our culture, uh, here's, here's a question. Um, since it's legal for same-sex couples to be married, would you marry a same-sex couple? Uh, and if not, why not? That's a good question, and, and the answer is, um, even though it is legal here, and it has been for a while, uh, I would not do it for two reasons. Uh, one is, I'm under the authority of the scriptures. Um, it's not about being homophobic. It's not about being a bigot. You know, I actually grew up, you know, in the Philippines and Hawaii and Las Vegas and in L.A., everywhere I've grown up, San Diego included, I just grew up in a culture where um, it was accepted, and... Um, but as, you know, as a Christian, as a pastor, I'm under the authority of the scriptures and what the scriptures has to say about marriage and sexuality. And the scriptures are clear that um, uh, that same-sex marriage goes against God's plan and design for marriage. And therefore, I would never be able to perform um, or solemnize uh, a marriage between a same-sex couple. And also, KCC does have a, a policy on that as well, um, an elders policy that's been in here, I think, since 2015, if I'm, if I'm correct, that uh, we don't perform uh, weddings between same-sex couples. And again, it has nothing to do with um, a hatred or an aversion towards you know, someone who lives that lifestyle, um, but it is by conviction. I'm under the authority of Jesus Christ. This is his church, and I, I'm not going to go against what he said, so... Yeah, in a similar vein, uh, of course, LGBTQ. Um, what would you know? What would your response be to that in terms of the lifestyle? Somebody wanting to be a part of a church community like KCC. What What would be your response to that? Yeah, and I think that one, you know, hits uh, home for my family because we do have I do have family members who I love who um, either identify or, or, or struggle with it. And you know, as a Christian, it's really important to to distinguish between, um, number one, loving a person and affirming a lifestyle. You can love a person and respect a person because everybody who, uh, whether they struggle with those issues or not, every human being is made in the image of God, which means every human being uh, needs to be treated and respected as an image bearer of, of God. And every human being is a recipient of the neighborly love that we're called to, we're called to give to everybody and also as a recipient of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so um, if someone who identifies, you know, in, in that category or those categories wants to come to the church and listen to the sermon and meet the people, you know, by all means. Um, at the same time, if they're looking for a pastor that wants to affirm that lifestyle, right, uh, then I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the guy. So how would I treat um, a person who's, uh, you know, who either identifies uh, but wants to become a part of the church. It's the same way I would treat anybody um, struggling or identifying with anything that goes against the scripture, right, which is uh, to remind them of the hope of the gospel, uh, the forgiveness of sins that comes through Jesus Christ, and to call them to repent and believe um, because there is hope. And so, and, and to give them all the love that the Holy Spirit has given me to be able to pour out into that particular individual. So, I want to maybe kind of ask a question, uh, maybe along the lines of counseling. Uh, you are a, a Bible counselor. Uh, you counsel people, and counseling is care for people's soul as a as a follower of Christ. And let me ask you this. And and this question, it seems, uh, if I, I feel personal in this one. And um, here's the question. You know, when someone is struggling through a disease or, uh, let's say, in particular, like cancer or remission from cancer, um, and they're just having those hard moments, it's really difficult. Um, how would you counsel them? How would you care for their soul? Uh, and, um, yeah, how, how about that question? I mean, first, it's 
with compassion, I mean, for me, you know, I feel like I can handle a lot of things. One of the things I just have a really tough time just dealing with when it does happen is anytime anyone in the family has um, or has some kind of a physical ailment that they're dealing with where they have to get hospitalized for something or get treatments, you know, for something, it's just, it's difficult as a father um, to have to, to deal with that and think through that. And, you know, for cancer patients or someone, you know, who's diagnosed but are going through treatments or is in remission, I think for, you know, for me, the way I've always approached it first is to remind them that the struggle that they feel, and sometimes Christians who, who are diagnosed with cancer, they're battling. It's, am I wrong for feeling just a sense of discouragement and, and anxiety about what's going to happen the next day? Um, and the answer is no, because um, the trial that they face is different than the ones than the ones we who who aren't diagnosed face, and it's it's not the same thing. We can't treat it as as the same thing. It's different for someone to wake up every morning not knowing if this is going to be the week, right? And so, pastorally, you have to, to be sensitive to that and to come alongside, um, knowing that. And reminding everyone, including myself, right, that, um, you know, the life and the breath of every creature is in the hand of God. And to remind them that they are in, they, they are in God's hands um, and that they're always wrapped around or by divine love, no matter where uh, or what kind of circumstances that they're in. And then to remind them that... Um, Every ounce of faith that they show through that process speaks volumes to the rest of us. Um, I, um, uh, my heart breaks every time I talk to uh, cancer patients, and yet at the same time, I also know that there's a kind of faith that's developing in them through that, through that process that is unique, um, that the church needs to see, um, and that can be a huge encouragement in the church, and that's why Paul says, my faith being strengthened by yours and vice versa, right? So, um, yeah, it, it is so true. And, um, you know, sometimes as pastors, you know, you don't, you don't know the words to say, uh, but the ministry of presence is so real. And um, I agree with you. You know, sometimes I feel like care for the soul while wow, my soul got cared for because of someone's faithfulness in spite of the difficulties. And, um, yeah, I just, I just really sense that. Uh, and, and, and back to your message, that is why we need to be in the church, the community of believers, uh, because um, it's, it's in the community that we, we strengthen one another. And uh, when we're disconnected from that, it, has a, it can have an impact on people. And so, um, yeah, we're just always uh, encouraged. Even as we try to give encouragement, many times we're just encouraged even more so. Uh, JR, let me ask you this. Um, what's your position on women in church leadership? And um, as a lead pastor, how will you see that women are nurtured through KCC's ministries? Yeah, I mean, uh, women make up more than, in a lot of churches, and, and perhaps in this church, more than more than half of the congregation, right? Um, and and it's the same way that men are nurtured, where the word nurtures, nurtures everybody, right? Everybody... Um, uh, is brought to maturity and strength in the faith through the preaching of the word. Um, and, f you know, for me as a, as a preacher, as a counseling pastor, um, usually, uh, I don't want to say the majority, it's kind of like when I, when I had to, actually, I worked as a personal trainer at a gym when I was trying to, you know, support myself through seminary. And what most people didn't realize is that the majority of my clients were actually women, you know. Um, whenever I've taught at schools, more than half of um, my students have been women at the seminary that I teach at right now. Um, uh, I say 50% because there are two students in the Greek class, but one of them is, you know, uh, one of them is a woman. <laughs> and so, um, and, uh, and actually when I do the math uh, here at the school, uh, more than half of the, uh, um, you know, and when I, more than half of the students are women in our Bible studies. When I was overseeing um, our home group Bible studies at, you know, at Creekside Church in San Jose, uh, more than half of our Bible study leaders that I was equipping and, and helping train and, and nurture in the faith um, were not just the women, but were the, um, the seasoned women, those over 50 years old, because they're the ones who had the wisdom to carry out that, uh, that, that brand of the teaching to the church. And so 
uh, to continue to provide avenues where um, you know I can be approached and, and be of help um, to continue to strengthen uh, those who are leading the women's ministries and the women's small groups, um, and and uh, you know to continue to build. Uh, you know, my wife is a huge has always been a huge um, you know part of that as well. And so um, she's poured into the women of the church in ways that, you know, as as a pastor, there's also there are appropriate boundaries, right? And so, and that's where she's uh, helped step in uh, many, many times in the past to help uh, complete that, right? So, yeah, thanks. Um, here's a question about how do you plan to strengthen the existing membership here at KCC, especially those over the age of 50? I'm over the age of 50. I guess I'm in that. Uh, I just noticed that. Um, so those over the age of 50, and then for the younger generation, how do you, uh, how do you see yourself, uh, well, how do you feel that the Lord might be impressing upon you to, to reach that older generation and that younger generation? Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the reasons why I've continued to teach at uh, the Bible Institute of Hawaii, I was first asked to teach there in, in 2022, April of 2022. I knew nothing about BIH. Many, some of you are a part of it. Um, and then one of the reasons why I've stayed and continue teaching, actually every quarter I haven't taken a break, is because the majority of my students are over 50. Um, actually, a lot of them are over, uh, are over 70, right? Um, and, and they're hungry for the word. And for me to make that commitment to continue to teach um, uh, the saints who have grown up in the church but, but want to keep learning, that, that's a commitment I want to make. Um, and, uh, you know, some, they, they can't leave their homes. You know, uh, one of my students has Parkinson's, you know, disease and therefore can't leave the home. But, and that's why I've made the provision to do this online format so that they can still continue to, to learn and grow as they desire, right? And, and that's also why once a month uh, I'll go to Kahala Nui uh, and, and preach for their, uh, for their service there to be able to spend time with, uh, the elderly saints of the church, because uh, the saints over fifty are the wisdom of the church, um, and, and and you know, and, and that demographic of the church needs to continue to be. I need to make myself available for any teaching, for any equipping, for any just time that is desired to be spent, because that's where the wisdom comes from. To your point, to the younger generation. Um, you know, if you are over 50 here, I'm not going to say that I can recognize you because I'm, I'm going to keep that out of here. But, um, but the younger believers do want your wisdom, right? And they have expressed that, right? They don't always know who to go to. So I've had younger believers actually tell me, can you set me up with, because I'm, I'm too afraid to ask, right? And uh, can you set me up with an older believer who I can uh, just get counsel from, who I can you know, get teaching from, get discipled by. And, and that's a part of how in a church uh, that's multi-generational, um, the younger generation is reached and the old generation continues to be equipped to do that. And so, uh, so for those here who are over 50, if you want me to do anything for you, you tell me and we'll make it happen. So that's why for BIH now, I'm, I am teaching through the book of Job because that was at some point became a request, right? Um, how I'm going to do that, still trying to figure that part out, but we'll do it. So, I signed up for that class, Jay. Oh, yeah, I, I am forgot. one of your students. <laughs> I am over the age of 50. Oh, boy. Well, I uh, want to maybe end with this, and it really goes back to your message, actually, this morning in that passage. And Jesus said that, you know, you've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And I think of, for myself personally, um, taking that figuratively in a sense of the keys. You know, I was given the keys to the church. I actually do have the keys to the church in my pocket. <laughs> but in a figurative sense, in ministry sense, I was given the keys to this church when, when Pastor Ron allowed me to lead worship up here. And uh, that was many, many years ago. Uh, and I, n I will never forget that opportunity that, that was given to me. I was equipped uh, to do that. And uh, it's given a, a, a responsibility and uh, a real... I guess I felt very empowered to do that. What would you say to someone who maybe is a young one or maybe young in their faith who doesn't know what kind of keys they should be given? Um, what impact can I have, big or small? Uh, what would you say to that person 
and then also, what would you say to someone who has keys? How, how can, um, what would you say to that person who, you've been given keys, but they're not just for you? What, what would you say to that? Yeah, first, uh, you know, in, in that passage in Hebrews where it says, you don't know if uh, by your good works you've, you happen to have entertained angels, right? Now, I'm not an angel, but, um, you know, I heard the gospel not from a pastor, right? Not from an evangelist or any, you know, any kind of, you know, famous preacher. I heard it from my brother who was in fifth grade at that time, right? And we didn't even have a local church around us, but he had heard the truth. And then I would be in my or our room, and here's what he would do. He would actually, he would just open up the Bible and just start reading it to me. And that, those words would continue to sink in my, right? Con- it continued to sink in my heart, and eventually the seed sprouted, right? And, um, and he heard the gospel from my uncle, who, who would also share with me, who also wasn't a pastor. And so, um, so everybody here who knows Jesus Christ has been given some capacity uh, um, to open up the doors to the kingdom of heaven in that sense um, to a person who's around you. And for people like my brother, uh, people like my uncle, they just took what they knew and were faithful with the relationships that they had who God placed in their midst. And whether it's one person or 50 people, um, uh, to be faithful to the people who God has placed. Um, And when the church does that, I mean, to, to see what can happen through that, right? And then for those who have been given the keys, because everybody has been given uh, a spiritual gift and some capacity uh, to invest in the kingdom of God, right? For one, to not compare yourself to anybody else, right? I mean, if I compared myself to Billy Graham, then I, <laughs> you know, I'd be discouraged every day, right? So, but to be faithful with whatever God has given you, to be faithful to those relationships, um, and uh, uh, but to know that, your life is not just yours. It's, it's the Lord's. Um, and in 2 Corinthians, right, he says, we who live uh, no longer live to ourselves, but to him who died and rose again, and uh, to be faithful, to be used by God in whatever context he's, he's placed you in. So, um, and to be faithful to share the gospel uh, with those around you, to live out um, the truth of the gospel in your own life, and the combination of those two things is is powerful. That's what I saw um, with my brother and my uncle growing up, you know, and, and that's eventually what led me to faith. So if you're happy with my preaching, you can blame them, right, because they, they led me here. So, Well, we're glad you're here, JR, and uh, thank you for your time this morning, and uh, I want to ask that we all pray, and um, I'll stand, JR, and you and I can stand, and we'll just pray, but would you bow your heads in prayer with us, sir? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have with Pastor JR and his family. And Lord, we just ask for your continued leading and guiding. And Lord, we are so grateful at the point where we're at, many, many months to get here. Lord, we got a few more days ahead of us, but God, we know you are in this and you are with us. And we have many plans, but God, you are the one who determines the steps. And so we give up, uh, we give ourselves to you and your sovereignty and your providence and all that you do. Lord, we uh, just thank you that we can be together and to hear from JR's heart. And Lord, uh, we just give this day to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone.